Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming. It's good to be with you here tonight, and I'm looking forward to spending the time over the next few nights with you thinking about how prophecy is being fulfilled in our time. And it's actually a very serious time in which we live. There's been some dramatic changes that have taken place here in America that have brought us to the precipice of the Sunday Law and other end time events that are predicted to be fulfilled. And um, I'd like to begin tonight with prayer, and then we're going to look at some Bible verses in Revelation 13 and other places, and then we're going to have a look at the background of the ecumenical movement and understand that a little more clearly. So if you'll kneel with me, if, pos if possible, we'll um, begin with prayer. Our Father in heaven, thank you so much for Christ, who is at, is at the center of our faith. And Lord, I just pray that tonight you'll give us the Holy Spirit, that we may understand the things that you would like for us to grasp. And we pray for your presence in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. Turn with me in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 13 a very central passage to the end time developments that we understand will be taking place. And I would like to focus just on a couple of verses, especially beginning, well, to begin with, let's look at verse 15. This is speaking of the second beast, which is what, uh, what nation? The second beast is the United States of America. Thank you very much. It says he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. That's a death penalty, my friends, for not worshiping according to the law. Okay? There is a law coming that is going to dramatically affect your life and mine. And it's not being talked about yet, it's not being agitated yet, but it is on the agenda. Uh, it's behind the scenes, and uh, we're going to consider that throughout this week to some extent. Now turn over to Psalm 94, and I want to point out that in order for verse 15 of Revelation 13 to be fulfilled... There has to be some way of changing America's attitude toward religion. How does America give life to the image of the beast? How does, how does America give the image to the beast the ability to kill someone for disobedience to a worship law? Well, America has to become much more religious than it is. That's one of the issues that we're facing in these last days. America has to become very, very religious. And I'd like to notice how this is happening tonight because we have just been through the 500th anniversary of the Reformation that began under Martin Luther. And we're going to look at that tonight. And I want to show you something about that that is very important to understanding the, the ecumenical movement um, but Psalm 94, if you will turn with me there, Psalm 94 is a very interesting passage. It gives us some information concerning the ecumenical movement. It doesn't mention it by name, but of course, that's never the way the Bible tells us. It describes what we are to expect rather than by naming it. And we'll look at Psalm 94, verse 20. It says, shall the throne of iniquity have fellowship with thee? What is the throne of iniquity? First of all, what's a throne? A throne is where laws are made. And the throne of iniquity is the place or the throne that, that makes laws that are wrong or are sinful or are leading people away from God's truth. The throne of iniquity is the throne that collaborates with the mystery of iniquity. What is the mystery of iniquity? Well, that was Satan, how he became uh, sinful. 
even though he was a pure being when he was created. He collaborates with an earthly agency, which is the throne of iniquity, which makes laws. Now, of course, Rome made many laws, and the United States will collaborate with Rome in making religious laws, just as Rome did through the Middle Ages. So this is talking about fellowship. Can God's people have fellowship with the throne of iniquity? Of course they can't. So how can there be an ecumenical movement for God's people? It's impossible. The true people of God can never engage in the ecumenical movement. Um, and that's what we see there in verse uh, 20. But it says more than that. It says, Shall the throne of iniquity have fellowship with thee, God's people, which frameth mischief by a law? You see, they're making laws that create mischief for God's people. And what law will create a lot of mischief for God's people? That would be the Sunday law, wouldn't it? All right, so verse 21 says, They gather themselves together against the soul of the righteous. When two or more people gather together, what do we call it? That's a conspiracy, isn't it? So this is a conspiracy against God's people. All right, that's what's happening behind the scenes. They gather themselves together. They collaborate together. They work together. They counsel together against the soul of the righteous and condemn innocent blood. Innocent blood are those who keep God's law because they have no, no sin because God forgives them of their sins and they continue to live by God's law through Christ who dwells within them. So, in other words... Those who are following Jesus and living by his law are the ones that are the target and focus of the mischievous laws that are made by the throne of iniquity. Verse 22 is a wonderful promise. The Lord is my defense, and my God is the rock of my refuge. Don't you love it? <laughs> I tell you what, without Christ, we would be hopeless. But thank God that we have Christ and he gives us not only hope, but he gives us victory over the enemy. He gives us power to resist his temptations and he gives us his righteousness so that we may live according to his law. So now we've been through the 500th anniversary of the Reformation. Now, 500 years ago, Luther nailed his 95 theses to the door of the Wittenberg Chapel. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. But now, 500 years later, Tony Palmer tells us that the protest is over. Remember that? Mm -hmm. Kenneth Copeland said that, um, that the, 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 the Reformation was just a big church squabble, a strife, he said. And now the Holy Spirit is overcoming it. That's virtually a, a direct quote. You know who Kenneth Copeland is, of course. Well, is he right? Was it really just a church squabble? A church fight? You know, church people fight sometimes, don't they? Because they're carnal, some of them. You know, they haven't really learned how to live in Christ. Or was the Reformation more significant than merely a church squabble? To understand what this men, these men miss, let's go back in history. Like so many other reformers, Luther was born in humble surroundings. He had a huge thirst for knowledge. But over objections of his father, he joined a monastery and became a monk, an Augustinian monk. There he found a copy of the Bible, the first Bible he'd ever seen there in the monastery, and he earnestly studied it. He had a sensitive conscience, and the more he studied it, the more he saw his sinfulness. He made himself sick by his austerities, his effort to rid himself of sin. He, had, he thought he had to do works in order to manage this. But one day, in his discouragement, he was talking to a fellow monk whose name was Staupitz. Staupitz, I, I hope that I get to meet Staupitz one day. I don't know whether I will or not. But he said something that changed Luther's life. It dropped a seed in Luther's mind. He said that Luther should look to the sin-pardoning Savior rather than to himself. Amen. And uh, this made a very deep impression and as I said, the Holy Spirit planted a seed. Eventually, he became a professor at the university at Wittenberg. There, he could study scriptures in the original language. Oh, this was really something that he wanted to do. He wanted to learn more. 
He became a powerful lecturer and a speaker, and the students just flocked to the university to study under Luther. But God was about to change his life. <clears throat> he had occasion to visit Rome, and he went eagerly. On the way, he stayed at monasteries, and the farther south he went, the more luxurious and corrupt these monasteries became. And this bothered him, bothered him greatly, so the Holy Spirit was planting another seed, right? That's the way God works. Plants a seed, and then another, and then another, until finally it all comes to fruition, and you have the flowering plant. Well, anyway, he was there in Rome, and he decided he needed to do some penance, and so he climbed so-called Pilate's staircase on his knees, which people still do today, by the way, uh, and while he was doing this, the Holy Spirit flashed into his mind a Bible verse. Does anybody know that Bible verse? Habakkuk 2, verse 4. It says, The just shall live by faith. And when Luther left Rome, the light flashed into his mind, and when Luther left Rome, he left it in heart also. Back in Wittenberg, he began to teach Christians that Christians should only accept that which is found in the Bible. Now, this is key. The Bible is the center of our faith. The Bible is the center of the controversy between Christ and Satan. The authority of the word versus the authority of man, or the authority of the church, or the authority of the magistrate, or the authority of anybody else. Which is it going to be? The Bible is already Luther's focus, his central focus. You know, he studied the Bible when he gets to Wittenberg. Then he studies the Bible, several languages, original languages in the university. He's already focused so much on the Bible. God is changing his life. It would become the great center of his struggle with Rome. The Bible is always the center of the struggle, and we need to remember that. Because in these last days, the Bible is still the center of the struggle. And Kenneth Copeland doesn't understand that. Neither did Tony Palmer or, for that matter, anyone else involved in that issue. Anyway, the idea of the Bible as the only rule of faith struck at the heart of Roman Catholic teaching. This is the central issue. Even today, as I said, is the Bible the final authority in your life or not? Or do you relate to the, other, to the opinions of other people before you make important decisions? Or for that matter, less important decisions. Is the Bible the final authority in the church? Or is the church policy the final authority? That's an issue that God's people have to face today. And like all true reformers, the Bible also became the center of Luther's life. Well, then came the worst abuse of all. Tetzel, you know who Tetzel was. He was selling indulgence to the ignorant, deceived, and superstitious people. And um, a man could now not only buy his way out of his past guilt, he could buy his way out of future guilt. Imagine, you could go sin now if you get an indulgence. Well, the Roman Catholic Church still prop, uh, proffers indulgences, doesn't it? If you know anything about what's going on in Rome... Uh, they still promote indulgences. They may not sell them, like, but you still have to do something to get them. You still have to pray a thousand times, or whatever it is. I don't know what the, what the requirements always are. They change and vary from time to time to get your plenary indulgence, but they still do it. And for the Protestants to think that Rome has changed is a deception that is going to lead them right back into the bosom of Rome. So, this was simony, and selling permission to sin was uh, very uh, bothersome to Luther. No one was willing to oppose this iniquitous traffic except for Luther. Luther responded to the selling of indulgences by the 95 Theses, which then he nailed to the door of the chapel at Wittenberg. And the battle was joined, all right? Germany, was Germany going to be loyal to the Pope or to the Scriptures? That's the key question that always comes up in every controversy uh, in the history of the church. Many people read Martin Luther's 95 propositions with great joy. 
they were a great relief to the sin-burdened souls. He kept pointing out throughout them, you know, the Bible says this and the Bible says that. Finally, someone had raised a protest. And within two weeks, get that, two weeks' time, everybody in Germany knew what Luther had done. And within two months, all of Europe knew what Luther had done. Why? Well, there was a network of people that had been, been cultivated underground. They were known as the Waldenses. Ever heard of the Waldenses? They went and they, they cultivated distrust of the Roman Catholic Church in the hearts and minds of the people. Can you imagine? I mean, they had to take the, the fascination of the people off of the priest and put it onto the Bible. That was their work, and they did it for a thousand years because they carried with them their little scripture texts in their pockets or in their baggage or in their sewn in their clothing or whatever, and they... They, th these texts focused on key problems with Rome's teachings and practices. And so they were very successful in creating this network of interest around Europe with all these people. And uh, that's, that's how they knew what Luther had done. There wasn't any faxes, no email, no, no you know, uh, social media, Facebook, or anything like that back then. And so word of mouth traveled very quickly, and the people... Um, appreciated this very much. So really, we can credit the Waldenses with the fact that Luther's Reformation was as successful as it was and as quick as it was. God had been preparing for Luther for centuries through those Waldenses. Now think about that. Do you think God is preparing to use you? And has he been doing it that long for centuries? Well, perhaps he has. I don't know. I, I look at God as, as someone who really um, has a lot to do with my work and my future. And I know that he's been preparing me all my life to do what I do. And I'm sure he's done the same for you. But my guess is, my belief is that he goes way back beyond that and started preparing for our work in these last days long, long, long ago. All right. So if you fail to do God's work, if you fail to do what God has appointed you to do, you're shortchanging the eternal kingdom of heaven. Anyway, the Catholic hierarchy wasn't very happy about Luther's 95 Theses. They did not want the Bible to be understood. It would destroy their control over society. Instead of challenging Luther's propositions, though, they accused him of pride, arrogance, and presumption, and hastiness. Ay, ay, ay. And Luther responded, he said, Who does not know that a man rarely puts forth any new idea without being accused of exciting quarrels and of some appearance of pride? Why were Christ and all the martyrs put to death? Because they seemed to be proud contemners of the wisdom of the times and because they advanced novelties without having first humbly taken counsel of the oracles of ancient opinions. What are the ancient opinions? Well, that's the church fathers and, and other <clears throat> sages that, that uh, have lived in the past. And uh, other ancient opinions that have grown hoary with age that are now espoused by church leaders. You know, you, you have to be, um, you, you, you have to go along with those. You can't, you know, you, you can't just come up with new ideas according to the Catholic Church. He went on to say, whatever I do will be done, not by the prudence of men, but by the counsel of God. If the work, can be, of God, if the work be of God, who shall stop it? If it not be of God, who can forward it? Not my will, nor theirs, nor ours, but thy will, O Holy Father, which art in heaven. Notice where the Holy Father was. <laughs> it wasn't in Rome. He was in heaven. That's from Great Controversy 131 and 2. Luther's work was not easy. Much opposition and, re and reproach arose against him. He, was weighed, he weighed these things heavily on his heart. It was much easier to keep quiet. Have you noticed? Human nature is that way. It's much easier to keep quiet than to speak up against some popular abuse. But his sensitive conscience would not let him stay quiet. May God grant that there'll be many of us who will not be quiet when there's something that needs to be addressed. Well, Luther was summoned to Rome, 
but his friends protested and asked that his trial be in Germany. So he was uh, summoned to Augsburg instead. At Augsburg, the legate, the papal legate, professed great friendliness, but insisted that Luther submit to the authority of Rome on every point, or he would be excommunicated. Now, excommunication was a very serious matter in those days. That's like being disfellowshipped, only worse. You have no chance of getting into heaven. You know, if you disfellowship someone today, well, they might have to find, they might find their way to heaven, but it, it'll have to be somewhere else, in other words. Um, but uh, in this case, you don't get any access to heaven or any other of the rituals of the Catholic Church that give you salvation. But notice in this that the authority of the church, not of the Bible, was Rome's argument. Luther's argument, on the other hand, was that the Bible was the only authority. And those who did not act according to it had no authority, according to Luther. So in other words, he was directly challenging the Pope. That's quite a contrast between the legate and Luther. But the legate did not understand the kind of man that Luther was. And nor does Kenneth Copeland or any of these others that are out there promoting the idea that the Reformation is over. Luther protested being required to retract without having been proved to be in error. And when the prelate saw that Luther's reasoning was unanswerable, he lost all self-control and cried out, Retract, or I will send you to Rome, there to appear before the judges commissioned to take cognizance of your cause. I will excommunicate you and all your partisans and all who shall at any time countenance you. This was quite a threat. And he said, I'll cast them out of the church. And then he finally declared in a haughty tone, an angry tone, retract or return no more. The reformer promptly withdrew. The cardinal legate was embarrassed and that he had failed, you know, to cower Luther and bring him to heel. There's an aside here that I'd like to share with you. Sometimes we have scales on our eyes until we have some kind of experience with unreasonable authority. We can't even see the danger we're in or the wrong thinking that we've had until we have a crisis. And at that point, things start to gel and we begin to realize that we have, that we have need of reform. I'll give you an example. Luther hated the Hussites. Remember John Huss? Luther hated the Hussites. He thought they were fanatics and merely rebellious. But after his experience in Augsburg, he read the writings of John Huss. And suddenly he realized what he was up against. He said, we have all, Paul, Augustine, he didn't understand Augustine, and myself been Hussites without knowing it. <laughs> Huss had upheld the Bible, and Luther was doing the same thing. The 95 Theses was only the beginning of the struggle. Luther penetrated the evil of the Roman Catholic system. His heart was burdened for the souls of the people that were steeped in her superstitions and vices. His voice rang out across the empire, exposing her sins and opening to view the corruption that the system protected. And he did it all by the Bible. He placed the confidence of the people in the Bible rather than in the authority of the church. And even today, Rome still protects her priests. Rome still does things that are um, forbidden in the Bible and are opposed to Scripture, even though Rome professes to uphold and, and believe in the Scripture. It's quite the opposite when you actually understand what Rome is doing. Luther said, it's a horrible thing to behold the man who styles himself Christ's vicegerent, displaying a magnificence that no emperor can equal. Is this being like the poor Jesus or the humble Peter? That's quite a point, isn't it? He is, they say, the Lord of the world, but Christ, whose vicar he boasts of being, has said, my kingdom is not of this world. Can the dominions of a vicar extend beyond those of his superior? 
I'm much afraid that the universities, he said, will prove to be the great gates of hell unless they diligently labor in explaining the holy scriptures and engraving them in the hearts of the youth. You see what he's saying? He keeps bringing back the scriptures. He keeps pointing the people to the word of God. And basically, he said, don't go to the universities because they don't teach the scriptures. Now, what universities do you know of today that teach the scriptures? Not very many, if any. He said, I advise no one to place his child where the scriptures do not reign paramount. Every institution in which men are not unceasingly occupied with the word of God must become corrupt. It's quite a statement, isn't it? This is very good advice for us today, too, don't you think? The whole nation of Germany was stirred. The people were so tired of the oppression imposed on them by the Catholic Church and by the feudal system. They were ready to rally behind reform, and that's what changed everything. Luther's enemies, the priests and monks, burned with revenge. They urged the Pope to take decisive action. The Pope decreed that Luther's writings were condemned and gave everyone 60 days for all to recant or be excommunicated. Well, two months later, very few had recanted. This was a terrible crisis, though, for Luther and his followers. Excommunication had struck fear into the hearts of these men and women. Excommunication was regarded with dread and horror because those who are excommunicated are not only put out of the church, they are cut off from society. They are hunted as criminals and outlaws. Luther said, what is about to happen? I know not, nor do I care to know. Let the blow light where it may, I am without fear. Not so much as a leaf falls without the will of our Father. How much rather will he care for us? It is a light thing to die for the word, since the word which was made flesh himself has died. That's quite an argument, isn't it? So what does life matter? What's more important? The Word of God is the center of it all. And by the way, you notice that he said, I don't fear it. In Christ, there is no fear, my friends. If we can just learn that, you know, if we could just learn that in our own lives, it would make a huge difference in us. Luther said, if we die with him, we shall live with him. And passing through that which he passed through before us, we shall be where he is and dwell with him forever. When the papal bull reached Luther, he said, I despise and attack it as impious and false. It is Christ himself who is condemned therein. I rejoice in having to bear such ills for the best of causes. Already I feel greater liberty in my heart, for at last I know that the Pope is Antichrist and that his throne is that of Satan himself. That's quite a statement, isn't it? Well, Luther was fearless, yet he knew that the work was God's, and that really he was a weak man. My enemies have been able, by burning my books, he said, to injure the cause of truth in the minds of the common people and destroy their souls. For this reason, I consume their books in return. <laughs> a serious struggle had just begun. Hitherto, he said, I have been only playing with the Pope. I begin this work in God's name. It will be ended without me and by his might. Don't you love his faith, his powerful faith? And when some taunted Luther that he was alone and his cause was weak and small, Luther said, who knows if God has not chosen and called me, and if they ought not to fear that, by despising me they despise God himself. Moses was alone at the departure from Egypt. Elijah was alone in the reign of King Ahab. Isaiah alone in Jerusalem. Ezekiel alone in Babylon. God never selected a, as a prophet either the high priest or any other great personage. But ordinarily, he chose low and despised men. Once even the shepherd Amos. In every age, the saints have had to reprove the great. 
kings, princes, priests, and wise men at the peril of their lives. I do not say that I'm a prophet, but I say that I ought to fear precisely because I, they ought to fear, pardon me, precisely because I am alone and that they are many. God stands by those who are faithful to him even when they're alone, doesn't he? I am sure of this, that the word of God is with me and that it is not with them. You see, Luther understood the Bible as having power over all of his enemies, over the whole society, and that it could change everything. And it did, as you will see throughout our time together. A second papal bull arrived, excommunicating Luther and all of his followers. The final separation had taken place. Ellen White makes this very interesting comment. She says, opposition is the lot of all whom God employs to present truths especially applicable to their time. There was a present truth in the days of Luther, a truth that at that time of special importance, there is a present truth for the church today. <clears throat> he has been pleased to place men under various circumstances and to enjoin upon them duties peculiar to the times in which they live and the conditions under which they are placed. God has truth for us to give in our day, doesn't he? And I'm thankful that we have a connection to that powerful truth. She goes on, there is the same disposition to accept the theories and traditions of men today instead of the word of God as in former ages. Those who present the truth for this time should not expect to be received with greater favor than were earlier reformers. All right. Is that clear? Traditions of men, whoops. The great controversy between truth and error, between Christ and Satan, is to increase in intensity to the, to the close of this world's history. It's getting pretty hot, isn't it? No sooner had Charles V ascended the throne of the empire than he was put in a difficult spot. The prelates of the church urged him to deal with the Reformation. But Frederick, the elector of Saxony, urged him to do nothing without giving Luther a hearing. Charles V was indebted to Frederick for his, his crown and his throne. Frederick requested a hearing before the impartial judges. Charles granted the hearing to be held in the city of Varms. You've heard of the city of Varms, haven't you? The Diet of Varms, it's not the Diet of Worms, by the way. The Diet of Varms attracted the attention of the whole nation. Political questions were to be addressed, of course, but the attention of all was focused on the issues swirling around the reformer. Reformers always get a lot of attention, have you noticed? And they're often controversial. That's God's way of bringing attention to what the reformer is doing and what God's truth is that the reformer is presenting. The Diet of Varms convened. Aleander, the papal legate, was entrusted to dealing with Luther. He urged the emperor not to allow Luther to appear at Varms for two reasons. Number one, the Pope had already condemned him, and if he appeared, he would then cast contempt on the authority of the Pope. You know, that's the church. They, they, they think that they're higher authority than anything else. He, second reason was that he feared Luther's cogent arguments would turn the princes against the church, which is actually what happened in the end, isn't it? The emperor knew that he could do nothing without the approval of the princes, so... He had no choice but to bring Luther. Anyway, Aleander was aggressive, and he spoke with vehemence and passion. It was actually a general remark. He is moved by hatred and vengeance, much more than by zeal and piety. The majority of the Diet were inclined to favor Luther. Charles told Aleander to present his case to the Diet. Providence ordered it, get this, Providence ordered that Rome should appear and plead by the ablest of her orators in the presence of the most august tribunals before she was condemned. You know, you ri let her rise up and then bring her down. Al that's right. Aleander was eloquent. He had great learning, but it wasn't in the scriptures. He rose to the auspicious occasion. 
charge after charge he hurled against Luther as the enemy of the church and state, the living and the dead, the clergy and the laity, the councils and the private Christians. And in Luther's errors there was enough, he declared, to warrant the burning of a hundred thousand heretics. This is the kind of language he used at the, at the assembly. Never had Rome looked so good as under Aleander's defense. The princes were inclined now to side with Rome and condemn the reformer. But Rome was about to become very insecure, even at the very moment of her strength. Duke George of Saxony stood up right at this moment and described the, with terrible exactness the deceptions and abominations of popery. The Duke was an enemy of the Reformation, and so his words had more power. Not even Luther could have more ably attacked the abuses of Rome. Listen to what he said in conclusion. These are some of the abuses that cry out against Rome. All shame has been put aside, and their only object is money, 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 so that the preachers who should teach the truth utter nothing but falsehoods and are not only tolerated but rewarded because the greater their lies, the greater their gain. It is from this foul spring that such tainted waters flow. Debauchery stretches out the hand to avarice. Alas, it is the scandal caused by the clergy that hurls so many poor souls into eternal condemnation. A general reform must be effected. And he didn't like Luther at all. In order to address these abuses, what do you think they did? Well, they appointed a committee to, to enumerate them and the necessary reforms. This would lead to greater clarity concerning the need for Luther's message. <laughs> Rome did not want more exposure. She wanted to silence the whole thing. Imagine how Aleander felt when the princes appointed a committee to study the abuses of the church. The Diet demanded that Luther come and present his case in spite of Aleander's protest. His friends were terrified. They knew the enmity that existed against Luther. They knew that the priest would pressure Charles V to revoke the safe conduct, and they feared that he would comply. They urged Luther not to go to the Diet, but Luther replied, The priests do not desire my coming to Varms, but my condemnation and my death. It matters not. Pray not for me, but for the word of God. Notice his focus. I love it. Christ will give me his spirit to overcome these ministers of error. I despise them during my life. I shall triumph over them in my death. They are busy at Varms about compelling me to retract, and this shall be my retraction. I said formerly that the Pope was Christ's vicar. Now I assert that he is our Lord's adversary, the devil's apostle. Varms was the most august assembly ever, Luther's appearance was a signal victory over the papacy, which had already condemned him. The very act of standing before the Diet was placing the emperor above the pope. But more than that, more importantly, Luther was there to place the truth above the pope, the Bible above the pope. The pope cut Luther off from society, yet in respectful language, he was summoned to the Diet. The pope condemned him to perpetual silence. Now he was to speak the truth before thousands. Notice how many? Thousands. It's more than, more than 1,000. It would be more than 2,000. Rome was descending from her throne at the top of the world. Luther was ushered in before the Diet. An imperial officer, notice it's not a church dignitary, read out the titles of his books and demanded to know if they were his and if he intended to retract them. Luther responded that the books were his, but he said of the second question, seeing that it is a question which concerns faith and the salvation of souls and in which the word of God, the greatest and most precious treasure either in heaven or earth, is involved, I should act imprudently were I to reply without reflection." I might affirm less than the circumstances demand or more than the truth requires. And so, in, and so sin against this saying of Christ, whosoever, whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. Matthew 10, 33. 
For this reason, I entreat your imperial majesty with all humility to allow me time that I may answer without offending against the word of God. Luther seemed awed and embarrassed by the assembly, and the papists thought that they had an easy target. So he was granted time. His calm and self-possessed answer convinced the assembly that he was not acting from impulse, not like Aleander anyway. During the night, Luther felt the danger, however. Dark clouds gathered around his mind. He threw himself on the Savior and pled for wisdom and strength. The next day, after much prayer, Luther presented his answer quietly and without passion. He gave his answer in German and then was asked to give it in Latin. This gave double force to his words because the council heard it twice. Minds had been so blinded by centuries of error that it was hard for them to understand the implications of what Luther was saying. Luther showed Aleander's arguments to be false and contrary to Scripture. Notice that, to Scripture, contrary. His tone was respectful and submissive. He displayed firmness to principle and clear reasoning. Since your most serene majesty and your high mightinesses require from me a clear, simple, and precise answer, I will give you one, and it is this. I cannot submit my faith either to the Pope or to the councils because it is clear as the day that they have frequently erred and contradicted each other. <laughs> That's an interesting point, isn't it? Unless, therefore, I'm convinced by the testimony of Scripture or by the clearest reasoning, unless I am persuaded by means of the passages I have quoted, and unless they thus render my conscience bound by the word of God, I cannot and I will not retract. For it is unsafe for a Christian to speak against his conscience. Here I stand. I can do no other. May God help me. Amen. Aleander resorted to threats the only course that Rome knows in the end. But Luther gained a friend at the council, Frederick, the elector of Saxony. He'd been disposed toward the reform doctrines, but now he decided to protect Luther. The Holy Spirit, no doubt, gave him an idea. And after counseling together, the princes decided that Luther should be given a second chance to recant. But he simply said that he had no other answer than what he'd already given. The papal leaders were embarrassed that their power which had caused kings and nobles to tremble, would be so despised by this lowly monk. After Luther finished his speech, Charles V declared his intention to protect the Catholic faith of his ancestors. You know, he was a Spanish monarch, you know. He had ancestors that were Catholic. He pledged to do all in his power to remove the heresy. And after Luther left the Diet, the papists demanded that his safe conduct be revoked. Charles said, I should not like to blush like Sigismund. Remember what happened to John Huss? Sigismund had revoked the conduct, and then John, was, John Huss was burned. So, um, but that brought great trouble in Bohemia, and there were wars that took place as a result. Anyway, that's another story. Luther was given opportunity to preach to the people on his way home to Wittenberg. Hundreds of nobles openly sided with Luther in spite of the emperor, and it caused a bit of division. <laughs> Frederick watched every move and studied carefully, calmly, concealing his purpose to protect Luther. And Luther never made it home to Wittenberg, as you know. Along the way, he was kidnapped and taken to the castle at Wartburg. It turned out that Frederick had arranged through his servants to care for Luther in hiding. But he told them that he did not, not, did not want to know where Luther was because if, they, uh, he, if he was asked by the priest if he knew where Luther was, he could honestly say no. At first, the papal leaders thought he was dead. Rumors abounded about Luther's death. He had disappeared. The people were angry. The priests feared the people that they would seek revenge against them because of Luther's death. But God had turned the tables on Rome, as you can see. Now they feared Luther more than his presumed, in his presumed death than in his life. The Wartburg, though, was perfect for Luther. It was quiet. 
a retreat where he could study and publish about great Reformation themes. God knew that he needed to get out of the fray and out of the controversy for a couple of very important reasons. First, Luther was in danger of pride and self-confidence, and he needed to be away from human praise. He had plenty of that. Second, the thing about Luther is he was a disruptor. You know, and, and people get tired of the, the same old thing all the time. You know how it is, even today. We have um, men that have been appointed to high positions because they, they are uh, against the establishment, so to speak. Well, this is what Luther was. He was against the establishment. So the people needed to learn to look to God, not to Luther. That's the second point. And the third point is that it would also give time for the Reformation to regroup and time for the papists to simmer down, you know, and look at it a little more carefully. Fourthly, and most importantly, the retreat at the Wartburg would give the reformer the opportunity to do his most important work. What was that? The translation of the scriptures. And um, Aleander, exalted as if the victory had been Rome's, he was also elated at the thought that the great enemy of Rome was dead. But then there appeared tracts that were unmistakably from Luther's pen, printed on the very presses intended to exalt the papacy. The imperial edict condemning Luther fell powerless. The people were more interested in the faith of Luther than they were in the edict condemning his writings and teachings. The word of his safety calmed the fear and the anger of the people. And it was interesting that when authorities forbid something like reading this writing or going to that place, what do people want to do? Well, they want to read it and they want to go there. <laughs> you know, they want to do the exact opposite thing that the authorities don't want them to do. While Luther did not understand everything that we understand today, his loyalty to what he understood of Scripture brought him God's blessings, and the same will happen for us. It wasn't time yet for all the reforms like the Sabbath and the state of the dead and all those things. Those came later. But God's work uh, had to be moderated. People couldn't take all the light all at once. So it couldn't go too fast. And while Luther was at the Wartburg, he worked on his translation of the Bible. It was the first Bible in the language of the German people ever. It was translated from the Eastern uncorrupted manuscripts that had made their way into the West. Luther actually used a compilation of the manuscripts of the New Testament compiled by Erasmus of Rotterdam. Erasmus was a man who was a time server. Ellen White speaks of him as a time server, which means that he basically was more interested in protecting his reputation than he was in protecting the truth. But anyway, he had done this work for the, the papacy, and they gave him a few more letters behind his name and patted him on the back. But Luther took Erasmus' compilation and translated it into the German language. It was the Bible he could have confidence in. It wasn't a Latin Vulgate like uh, Wycliffe had used, but it was a uh, manuscript, it was a compilation of manuscripts that had come from the East at the time of the Crusades or when the, the Crusades before the Reformation had come. So let's step back for a second. Just in time for the Reformation, there were certain things that happened. First of all, the Gutenberg Press had been invented, right? That was used by the Reformers very effectively. Secondly, the Crusades that had happened before the Reformation had opened up the East so that the pure Bible manuscripts could come to the West with the refugees that had uh, come from the East to the West. The corrupted Vulgate was from the Gnostics in Alexandria, Egypt, and it had been translated, of course, by Jerome in the 4th century. The Waldensian uh, missionaries had done their work. Uh, that was the fourth thing that had happened in time for the Reformation. And so there was a lot of religious foment going on in the empire. But placing the Bible in the hands of the common people meant that it would do something for Germany that most people don't understand. It meant that more people would want to read it. 
but they were ignorant peasants. They couldn't read. So what did they do? They went back to night school. Ever heard of night school? They went to night school so they could learn how to read and learn how to read the Bible. But this then, in turn, elevated the intellectual capability of the German people, and for that matter, other Europeans. Soon, there were inventions that made life more efficient and more productive. That meant that the economy could improve because of greater efficiency, and that gave rise to the middle class. You see, the feudal system only had the very rich and the very poor. But now you had this middle group, and it's the middle class that drives the economy forward. So Germany was already starting to improve in its economy just because of the Bible in the language of the people. The schools were full, especially the night schools, all because the Bible printed in the language of the people was available for them to read. The priests and monks were ignorant of the scriptures, and often the common man knew more than the priest did about the Bible, and this led to great embarrassment among them. Protestants in their Bibles had gained the day. Rome stood by helpless as light swept across Europe. Suddenly there was a great desire to learn, especially the scriptures. Luther, by the power of God and by the word of God, had unleashed a long pent-up principle of human nature, the urge to know. It resulted in a great revival of learning. It corrected evils of society brought on by papal superstitions and vices. Charles V, however, was determined to do what he could to stamp out the reform, keep them in ignorance. He called for a special diet to be held in Spire in 1529. All the princes were required to be there. He presented them with an edict restricting religious liberty and prohibiting any further dissemination of the reform doctrines. Papists were exultant and came to the Diet in great numbers. King Ferdinand, who was the emperor's representative at the Diet, tried to persuade the German princes to ratify the edict, but they were unwilling because they'd already seen how Germany had benefited by the Reformation and by the Bible in the hands of the people. They'd been blessed. Eventually, the edict was drawn up as an imperial decree and that all they could do then was submit. The princes drew up a protest that was immediately read at the council. We protest, they said, by these presents before God, our only creator, preserver, redeemer, and savior, and who will one day be our judge, as well as before all men and all creatures, that we, for us and our people, neither consent nor adhere to any, in any manner whatsoever to the proposed decree. In anything that is contrary to God, to his holy word. Now, what had Luther been teaching all along? The Bible was paramount. Now the princes have picked up on that, and they put this in their protest. To our right conscience and to the salvation of our souls. The Holy Scriptures ought to be explained by other clearer texts. The Holy Book is in all things necessary for Christians, easy of understanding and calculated to scatter the darkness. We are resolved by the grace of God, they said, to maintain the pure and exclusive preaching of His only Word, such as it is contained in the biblical books of the Old and New Testament. So they defined what the Word was, didn't they? Without adding anything thereto, that may be contrary to it. This Word is the only truth. It is the sure rule of all doctrine and of all life and can never fail or deceive us. He who builds on this foundation shall stand against all the powers of hell, while all the human vanities that are set up against it shall fall before the face of God. There is no sure doctrine but such as is conformable to the word of God. The protest uh, opposed two abuses. One, the intrusion of the civil magistrate into matters of faith, and, this, and secondly, the arbitrary authority of the church. Those are the two things that they were especially concerned about. So now listen carefully. The principle of Protestantism sets the power of conscience above the magistrate and the authority of the word above the church. Conscience and the word, all right? These two principles are at the center of Protestantism. 
Policies of the church that conflict with the word are invalid, according to true Protestants. Policies of the state that conflict with conscience cannot be good policies. This, um, uh, the religious conflicts today that we have over same-sex marriage, over Obamacare's provisions um, that, offend, that are offensive, um, these have created conscience issues for many people today. And so this same issue, conscience and the word, is what we are going to be facing and already are facing in some ways. Anyway, we'll get more into that as we go along. The, protest, the protest of the princes is what gave, of course, the Protestants their name because they adhered to the Bible and opposed Rome. But Charles wasn't finished with the Reformation. He began to prepare to crush the reform with a sword. Just in time, however, as storm clouds were thickening around the Reformation, God intervened. He opened up the arsenal of uh, the Turk <laughs> against Charles V, and they, the, the, the Muslims invaded Europe once again. So another crusade was on. Charles had to divert his armies and his intentions from the Reformation and turn them against the invaders. So God used the Turk to advance his cause. The Crusades opened up the East so that the pure Bibles could come to the West, and now the Turk prevented the emperor from crushing the Reformation, which, of course, was his intention. Islam is a great threat to Rome's authority um, in the empire, uh, even today, or what is to be the seventh resurrection of the Holy Roman Empire. It, it still is the same way as it was back then, really, in many ways. And God knows, my friends, how to protect his people. If you're loyal to the word, God will protect you. That's all we have time for for this presentation. But next presentation, we're going to carry on with some other very important aspects that bring it right down to our own time. So let us uh, close with prayer. If you can, please kneel with me. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the word of God that has been the inspiration of the reformers of the past, and it is the inspiration of your people in these last days. It is the power of God in, in text form so that we may become his people in the fullness of his truth. May we have the strength to resist the temptations of the enemy and live by our conscience according to the word. In Jesus' name, amen.